Hello, my name is Erin South, and welcome to the FDA Office of Women's Health Scientific Speaker Series. Today's talk is titled Sickle Cell Disease, a Spotlight on Women. Before we begin, I have a few announcements regarding continuing education credit for this activity. Speakers attest that the content they contribute is supported by the best available knowledge or evidence and gives a fair and balanced view of diagnostic and therapeutic options. They are reminded to disclose when products or procedures being discussed are off-label, unlabeled, or not FDA approved, and any limitations on the information that is presented. Our speaker, planning committee, and CE consultation and accreditation team report nothing to disclose. All of the relevant financial relationships listed for these individuals have been mitigated. The views expressed are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect official policy of the U.S. FDA. No official endorsement by the Office of Women's Health or U.S. FDA is intended or should be inferred. All inquiries for information should be directed to me, Erin South. All registered participants will receive a CE credit claiming code and claiming instructions by email within 24 hours after the webinar. All learners claiming CE credit must attest to their attendance and complete all required activity evaluations in the FDA CE portal, ceportal.fda.gov, within 14 days after the activity ends. Upon completion, learners may view and print a statement of credit. Attention NABP pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. The FDA CE team will report your credit to the NABP provided you add your NABP ID number and date of birth to your profile in the FDA CE portal. The only official statement of credit is the one you pull from CPE Monitor. If you do not see your credit reflected on CPE Monitor after 45 days of attestation, please contact FDA CE team at fda.hhs.gov. CPE Monitor sets a strict 60-day limit on uploading credits. Closed captioning is available by toggling the button at the bottom of the screen. And throughout the presentation, you may type your questions for our speaker into the Q&A pod, and we will address as many as time allows. And now for some quick pre-poll questions. A two, our first question, a two-week-old newborn is in clinic for their second newborn screen test. The parents confide in the pediatrician that they are worried about the test results because they have a family history of sickle cell trait, and they know mom is a carrier because her obstetrician performed testing. Which of the following is the most accurate regarding newborn screening? A, sickle cell disease cannot be detected on newborn screen and the baby will have to be tested in the pediatrician's office. B, in the US, less than 50 babies are born with sickle cell disease annually. C, sickle cell trait is more common than sickle cell disease on newborn screening. Or D, newborn screen results are not sent to parents, only the doctor who performs the test. Okay, and we will wrap up question one and bring up our second question. Question two, True or false, the 2021 Medicaid and CHIP sickle cell disease report revealed discrepancies between recommended evidence-based care and actual care received by beneficiaries. True or false? We'll give everybody just a few more seconds. Okay, we'll wrap up question two and bring up our third and final pre-poll question. Which of the following is not recommended when providing comprehensive care for a woman with sickle cell disease? A, menstruation history because it may be associated with increased hospitalizations. B, all immunization history as it may impact risks with pregnancies and future transfusions. C, discuss benefits and risks of hydroxyurea discontinuation during pregnancy. D, opioids may be used during pregnancy, although there is a chance of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Or E, genetic counseling is not required since mom already knows she has sickle cell disease. Okay, and we will wrap up question three 
and we will learn the correct responses uh, in our speaker's presentation, so stay tuned. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome our guest speaker. Dr. Titi Lope Fashipa is co-director of the Texas Children's Sickle Cell and Thalassemia Program and assistant professor of pediatrics in hematology oncology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She is passionate about public health strategies to curb the psychosocial barriers and health complications of individuals with sickle cell disease. She is actively involved in various sickle cell focused community and policy efforts aimed at understanding and addressing these challenges. Dr. Fashipa has been repeatedly appointed to sickle cell related advisory committees of the Texas Department of State Health Services and currently serves on their newborn screening advisory committee and chairs the Sickle Cell Task Force. Her professional memberships include the American Academy of Pediatrics, Heartland Southwest Sickle Cell Disease Network, American Society of Hematology, and the ASH Research Collaborative Sickle Cell Disease National Community Advisory Board, American Society of Pediatric Hematology Oncology, NHLBI Sickle Cell Disease Advisory Committee, and Community Input Panel of the NHLBI Cure Sickle Cell Initiative. Dr. Fashipa has the unique perspective of relating to and understanding the need for education, community awareness, support, and medical care, as she is a pediatric hematologist, as well as an individual with sickle cell disease. On behalf of the Office of Women's Health, please welcome Dr. Titi Lope Fashipa. Thank you so much, Erin. I um, really appreciate being here. And I want to thank the FDA Office of Women's Health for this um, invitation. And thank you again for the introduction. Uh, my voice this is a little bit hoarse for me, so I apologize. Um, but I think uh, I'm still understandable. But if you hear me cough a little bit or clear my throat, um, I'm, I'm finishing up, I think, the end of a cold. All right, so let's dive right in. Um, first, you notice that I don't have disclosures um, that are within the, um, you know, the window of, uh, of, I guess, where it's acceptable. However, I just wanted to um, make sure that you guys were aware that um, I have done either consultancy work with certain um, industry partners that do make drugs for sickle cell disease or do clinical trials for sickle cell disease. Most of these are education-based projects, and you'll see one um, in my presentation uh, very briefly, and then also some research support in the past as well, and just because each of these entities have done some work with sickle cell disease. Um, but my true disclosures are that I am a pediatric hematologist, so that's my, my main uh, bread of, and butter in regards to the um, expertise side of things from a healthcare provider. However, I am a sickle cell warrior and advocate as mentioned in my um, introduction. And I have become a, almost like a student of sickle cell disease on various levels, not just the level from the healthcare side. So um, some of what we talk about today are things that I have learned and I hope um, you find them interesting as well. Um, here are our objectives. We'll summarize the clinical characteristics of sickle cell disease and explore advances in medical and potentially curative therapies. Acknowledge the role of historical and systemic disparities on health outcomes um, with emphasis on um, impact on women um, with sickle cell disease, and then describe the impact of national and state health policy initiatives, as well as summarize some of the unique uh, factors impacting women with sickle cell disease. So I decided to break this up um, by giving you a snapshot of an individual's life. And um, myself and a colleague uh, had this idea when we presented a grand rounds to our state uh, Department of State Health Services. And um, I felt it would be effective for today's presentation so we can go through kind of the process of what it means to grow up with sickle cell disease as well as um, the, the historical perspective. So let's meet Sarah. Um, she's a two week old infant. Her parents just found out that she likely has sickle cell disease because of her newborn screen results. And the pediatrician says, hey, you need to see a pediatric hematologist. So as a pediatric hematologist, what are the things that I consider and discuss when I'm meeting the family? Well, 
Um, our, for our purposes, we're going to focus on the historical perspectives of sickle cell disease and what it looks like to diagnose it and the prevention of early childhood morbidity and mortality. So this is um, my um, life um, when I am in clinic. It, it's, I always deal with this recurring paradox. Um, families will come in with these precious babies, sweet, sweet little babies looking perfect. And they have this diagnosis um, looming over them. And um, so for me, when you think of the, the pain and the ugliness associated with sickle cell, you know, it's reflected very effectively in this painting by uh, Mr. Hertz Nazaire, who is now unfortunately late, but he was a sickle cell advocate and he was expressed himself through his beautiful artwork. Um, this is my favorite painting of his because I feel like it's also a call to action, um, but it captures very well the, the burden of sickle cell disease. So it's very hard for a family to bring in a perfect looking baby and have to figure out how to package, how to educate, how to explain to them the components of sickle cell disease without scaring them too much, but also uh, making sure that they know that we do need to take caution and, and be careful. And so it's a struggle. And depending on the type of family, the conversation can go in many different ways based off of their prior experience with sickle cell disease. Um, but that's kind of the first thing to sink in. This family bringing in their precious baby, they've just been delivered devastating news. Now, why does this happen? Well, since 2006, all 50 states have been offering sickle cell disease or hemoglobinopathy screening on their um, newborn screening panels. And so now in this country, you'll know before the disease starts to express, express itself, um, which is not the case uh, worldwide. And just for your uh, benefit, this on the newborn screen, you'll see certain patterns. And these patterns, the ones that are starred are the ones associated with the type of sickle cell disease. And so what is sickle cell disease? Well, yeah, gene genetic uh, blood disorder um, and the mutation is in hemoglobin and you either inherit two copies of the abnormal hemoglobin S or you have compound heterozygosity with hemoglobin S and another abnormal hemoglobin. So you can see that the common types are SS, um, again, that homozygous um, inheritance or some of the combo patterns such as SC and S beta thalassemia, which comes in two flavors as, rare, as well as some rare types. Um, but there are countless ways for hemoglobin to be um, mutated. And so you can see that if it partners with the S, it usually means um, the person will have a type of sickle cell disease. So the global burden of sickle cell disease, well, the mutation um, originated in Africa. And you can see that in um, other parts of the world, sickle cell is not a rare disease, and the United States is considered rare because it impacts less than 200,000 people in the country. Well, countries like Nigeria um, have about 100,000 babies born a year with sickle cell disease. America's total population is quoted to be or estimated to be 100,000. So you can kind of see um, the, that big uh, discrepancy there. And I like this version of um, the population map because it shows um, the burden based off of the size of the country. And so countries like Nigeria and India being number one and two, and then Democratic Republic of Congo, number three. Um, but it is quite um, affecting millions of, of individuals worldwide and hundreds of thousands of babies are born a year. So we know this. Um, um, originated, of course, uh, most of you are familiar with this concept of the malaria uh, hypothesis, um, where in the thousands and thousands of years ago, actually in the Saharan desert, desert area, before it was a desert, it was actually tropical. And um, there was malaria. And that's when the first noted uh, mutation was felt to have arrived, where a person had sickle cell trait. And that person ended up having a survival benefit because of the sickle cell trait. And so the mutation was passed on and those with sickle cell trait tended to do better when they had malaria. And so with sickle cell trait, and uh, sometimes I refer to it almost like a, a superhero type of power. And interestingly, I was referring to this as a superhero power before Supercell came out. I don't know if those who've watched the Netflix uh, show, but um, I actually have not yet seen it, but I'm looking forward to it. But I have the sense that 
there's a reason for this mutation, a beneficial reason, and most of our hemoglobin mutations reflect this way to protect against malaria. Well, since then, um, you know, of course, it's spread and it's now worldwide um, for the Americas, first through transatlantic slave trade, but of course, now in today's world, there's a lot of migration. So sickle cell can impact anybody. It doesn't have a one uh, face. It's not just in people of African descent. Um, you can be any ethnicity and have the sickle cell gene um, potentially. So in the countries that I described in Sub-Saharan Africa today, when a child is born, it's almost like a coin flip whether or not they're going to survive to adulthood. In fact, it's sad, but by the age of five, um, about 50% of children will die and they're dying of infection. And now if you look at this uh, graph that shows 1979, um, uh, the, the dotted line, 1979, and then the solid line, um, more recent data, you can see that this was happening in America too. There was high uh, early childhood mortality related to infection. And I'll explain why the numbers have now diminished. And so today we'll say in a high income country that has preventive care for sickle cell, you are almost guaranteed to reach adulthood. So about 90% of children make it to adulthood. Um, but it is still the high risk nature that allowed sickle cell to be on newborn screening because you don't know your child has it until sometimes it's too late. And so early diagnosis is key. Um, again, I mentioned it's universal in the United States um, current, now. And then early initiation of the things that prevent infection and the things that prevent organ damage. So penicillin prophylaxis um, and immunizations for infection precautions and then hydroxyurea to prevent organ damage. And education, you know, their child needs to be seen slightly different from their sibling or rel other relatives where you can watch a fever in a, maybe a, a nor another three-year-old, but in your three-year-old, you need to be a little bit more cautious. And we teach them the things to recognize in regards to various types of um, complications with sickle cell disease. The other impactful measure for sickle cell disease in early childhood is screening for the risk of stroke. And we do that with a transcranial Doppler. Um, we focus on the higher uh, risk groups, uh, which is hemoglobin SS and S beta zero thalassemia. So let's talk a little bit about hydroxyurea. And for all the drugs, we'll snap, do, do a little deeper dive uh, since you guys are FDA. Um, so hydroxyurea, it has been um, basically a life-changing uh, medication and very, very impactful. Um, if you are a disease that only has one drug for, for that scenario, hydroxyurea actually is quite impressive. It's famous for being associated with the increase of fetal hemoglobin. So when you take it, um, it causes stress erythropoiesis and you make more uh, red blood cells that are immature that are full of fetal hemoglobin. And that leads to several other benefits. Um, you have less cellularity, so there's not as much um, inflammation around. You have more cells with hemoglobin F. They tend to be bigger and um, well, better hydrated. And so that uh, those things that we see that are like things you can follow on lab values, they're actually associated with a health benefit, um, including what I call that beneficial myelosuppression. Not enough at the levels of chemotherapy level, which hydroxyria was, uh, of course, initially used for but enough to tone down some of the inflammation of the disease. And so FDA approved it in 1998 for the use of adults and later approved it in children. And there were several studies. It has a beautiful report card. Uh, this timeline is what I call hydroxyurea's report card, where it continued to show benefit upon benefit for sickle cell disease and reducing organ damage. Um, it's not a cure, but it is quite an effective therapy. Now, so I listed all the preventive measures we do for children, but what are the gaps in these uh, healthcare outcomes? Well, this story actually originated from Texas. New York Times um, said, hey, there's these two sisters, they live in a town not too far from a big city, and yet they have sickle cell disease and nobody ever screened them from a stroke, even though they were born in our modern time when we already knew how to do that. And so it wasn't until after they developed a stroke that they were um, entered into more expert care for their sickle cell disease. And this title says it all, devastating and preventable. 
And that is just painful that we are still in a situation where we know what to do and not everybody is getting access to that care. Medicaid and CHIP um, did an analysis of their 2017 data and they released this report in 2021. And it's the first actually comprehensive report showing um, the impact of sickle cell disease and um, for Medicaid beneficiaries and CHIP beneficiaries. And so this is a total of about, about 40,000 individuals. And, um, and my state was a huge, chunk, was a big chunk of that. Um, and so it, it showed discrepancies, hands down. 30%, um, 36% of children who are supposed to be screened with a transcranial Doppler for their uh, stroke risk, um, those were the ones getting screened. And there's like so many more missing. And then 37% um, of children and only 35% of adults are being prescribed hydroxyurea uh, faithfully. And then even more scary, not children that you expect the high risk population, high risk for infection, they did not have a full year of penicillin. In fact, the majority of them had little to no penicillin. And um, what about vaccines, which we say, okay, at least all children in America can get access to vaccines. And we chose, um, in this case, they looked at the um, Prevnar 13, uh, sorry, the pneumococcal vaccine 13 valent one. And that particular vaccine is um, all pediatricians have access to that. 60% of children under age two were re receiving the appropriate care. So there is a gap, there is a gap and we need to um, uh, decrease that gap. This is not something that's new. In 20, 2006, there are reports discussing the equity and quality that, hey, we know we're supposed to be doing TCDs. We know we're supposed to be giving penicillin, um, but we're not seeing it happen. More recently um, in 2021, um, the display study has been trying to not only look at the gaps, but do something about it. And here's an example of how to promote more health literacy regarding um, transcranial Doppler. If I tell you your, your child is getting a transcranial Doppler, um, you know, and I say all this fancy medical language, maybe it will not penetrate. But if I emphasize the word stroke and that this is a sickle stroke screen, um, what would that do um, to empower families to be like, hey, I know my child is supposed to be having stroke screening. Um, and so this is an example of how to achieve that equity. So let's uh, catch, catch up with Sarah a little bit later. She's now nine years old and her parents are like, you know what, she's missed a lot of school. Um, she's having recurrent hospitalizations. So what are these common challenges faced by school-aged children? And so we're gonna focus on the acute complications of sickle cell disease, as well as the importance of educational support. Here's our beautiful pathophysiology slide. I'm very um, proud of this. You can see, you can see uh, why I, I was uh, fortunate to be one of the co-authors in this um, recent um, review on sickle cell disease. And it, in the top uh, graphic here, you can see that red blood cells that are oxygenated, even those with, um, in people with sickle cell disease, they tend to look the normal shape. But when they're deoxygenated, um, instead of maintaining that shape, it causes the hemoglobin to polymerize. And that's when you start getting the distortions and, and the convolutions. And so that leads to two things. One, the cell is more fragile. And so you get hemolysis. And this leads to most people with individual, most individuals with sickle cell disease having anemia. Um, but it's not just having anemia, it's spewing out some stuff too. So in the top uh, arrow, you'll see cell-free hemoglobin, and that leads to other reactions that um, mess with the nitric oxide pathway leading to more vasoconstriction. And then on the side of the sickling, the shape, you end up getting stickier cells. They at attach themselves to the endothelial wall and the, they bring some friends. It causes a lot of inflammation and that um, continues to propagate the, the drama. And so we see sickle cell disease as a chronic disease, especially now that I say most of them make it to adulthood. So this is a disease that you can follow. Um, however, it has a lot of acute complications and they're quite unpredictable in nature. You can't say, oh, you are definitely going to have these things happen to you. Even in the same family, it can present very differently. And I love this uh, picture from Nature Reviews that shows the acute complications in the light yellow and the green, the more chronic ones. Um, so when you look at this um, by how frequent, the most common cause for a person to present um, in an acute problem with sickle cell disease is because of pain. And so you can see that that takes um, the, the bill. However, other very severe complications like acute chest syndrome, um, aplastic crisis, which if you haven't heard, we're going through a parvovirus 
um, wave right now, um, causing more of this number to rise. Um, but there's several reasons why a person will present acutely and unpredictably um, with sickle cell disease. And sadly, this is linked to mortality. And so what about education? Well, even when you don't have a risk of stroke, like with the transcranial Doppler, let's say you had normal screens and all of that, you can still be impacted um, in a neurocognitive way. And so it is now recommended, and this is recent recommendations from American Society of Hematology, to assess for these delays early and for any other associated neurodevelopmental disorders. And so whether it's subtle academic problems or behavioral changes, um, and even things that were like, oh, ADHD, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, these might be expressions of um, the brain being impacted by sickle cell disease and making sure we advocate for academic support, whether the bare minimum is a 504 plan, um, but a child may require individualized um, education programs as well. And this carries over to adulthood. So I tell um, graduating teens that you have to think of a 504 plan for life. So whether that's in college or Office of Disability or in your workplace with your uh, human resources and Office of Disability there, always think that you need accommodations or a 504 plan. All right, so now Sarah, she's 19 years old. She's taking classes at the local community college. And you know, she's thinking, I wanna go out of state for, for uh, to further my education, um, but I am nervous. I've always known my same sickle cell provider. Who should I be thinking of when I'm um, transitioning? Do I, does that affect the college I go to? Um, and our question for this uh, part is to reflect on the high risk nature of the transitional uh, period between pediatric to adult care. And what does it look like to have readiness in this population and the various barriers? And then we'll focus a little bit more on the pain that I started off with. So let's look at this mortality curve again. This is disturbing. I was in a lecture um, once where the speaker referred to this as the bump. Um, you can see in the 1979, there was a bump too in this kind of adolescence range. Um, but I told you that, oh, 90% make it to their 18th birthday, you know, all is well. But why is there this increased slope here if we expect more people to be uh, here for their mortality? This is quite disturbing. What is it associated with? And so I, um, of all the things in sickle cell, this is one of the things that concern me um, the most. And I lose sleep sometimes over our teenagers and young adults, um, wishing that the world was a better place um, and trying to work with others to get it there. And so what is associated with this healthcare deterioration um, during the transitional years? Why do you see that, that spike, that bump? Well, starting from the health system itself, let's just call it out. Um, there are not enough adult trained providers. And um, a lot of children, we talked about Medicaid and CHIPS uh, earlier, there are states where some children lose their Medicaid after they turn 19. Um, and, or they don't have a parent that has that um, private insurance. And then that care coordination, we're not good at handing off between the pediatric to adult side and the systems are quite different. And then for adult providers, when you investigate, well, is it just um, only a lack of expertise? It's also the concerns that um, cerebral-based specialties like hematology um, that don't have a lot of procedures and it require a lot of care coordination, um, that reimbursement is not usually reflective in the work that it takes to take care of patients. So those are some healthcare factors. Um, what about the fact that they are getting older um, and the, their disease is no longer that pediatric a phase where maybe they only had a, a handful of problems. Um, you start seeing evidence of some of that more long-term damage and the combination of having repeated hits, um, as I usually tell them, like same hits to the same area and some of the damage becoming more permanent. And then the socio-behavioral factors of being a, having a teenage brain, right? Um, a lot of them are still learning how to care for themselves. And with sickle cell, it's there is an association with um, less executive functioning, um, uh, especially at the same ages compared to their peers. And so you usually see individuals that are not have all, it, they don't have all their ducks in a row. They have great intentions and they're not able to organize themselves in a way to get to point A to point B to point C. And you can imagine doing all the regular life stuff, figuring out a college, job, 
and then also your healthcare. And um, we have a, I mentioned this on the healthcare side, but there is a problem of us engaging families and patients and really um, letting them know that uh, it is a safe space. And this is where a lot of people start to develop their mistrust of the healthcare. They're usually mistreated by somebody that they considered a healthcare professional once in their teenage life. And that seems to uh, maximize and increase as they continue to grow older. And that makes them stay away. And, um, and sometimes that leads to that increased morbidity. So they're presenting when they're much more sicker and without um, the right uh, care. And so I mentioned, I was part of an education program by former Bridge and um, a survey there showed that 60% consider that their overall transition experience from pediatric to adult care is moderately challenging or very challenging. And um, the top challenges that people said was, well, I didn't have support. Um, and the physician agreed. They're like, yeah, there's not transition support. And then the psychological and mental health support is limited as well as how do I get from point A to point B? And how do I stay with a provider and have trust with that person? And so there's several articles written about that transition period and the factors to consider and the fact that this mortality problem is still present even today. Um, I participated in a survey to look at more recent data and sadly it was very similar to that of 10 years ago. Um, and I, I love this quote, finding a great doctor to work with is hard. Not many specialists focus on sickle cell disease. They know about the illness, but they don't truly understand the patient experience. That captures several elements of the barriers that I mentioned. So where is our solution? Well, it does start with looking at verified sources. Got Transition has helped several diseases um, figure it right, figure it out. And we are trying to incorporate this more and more on the pediatric side and also on the adult side. Transition readiness is not about your age. It's a it's a, a stage of life. So sometimes the moment that your age is 21 or 19 or whatever it is, your hospital says you need to go to an adult care, it doesn't always line up with your full readiness. And I think it's important for the receiving provider to realize that, okay, well, they know how to do these things, but they still need help with these other things. And so what about pain? Let's talk a little bit more um, about that. I am... Um, uh, pain is triggering and they're, uh, in, in, for, for many individuals with sickle cell disease. And I'll just say that um, when you're younger, there's a clear beginning, middle, and end. You have a pain crisis, um, but there is this appreciation that it will go away and be gone, and you'll have a pain-free period of time. And usually you can associate it with a trigger. Um, oh, I stayed up late studying for a test or stayed up playing with my friends. Um, the weather changes. I got a cold um, or something like that, or I did increased activity and that led to my crisis. People can sometimes associate it with a trigger, not always, um, but again, it, it's pretty defined and there are pain-free days. As someone ages and progresses to adulthood, sometimes, um, and the number is reported as high as 30 to 40% of adults with sickle cell disease will transition to a more chronic pain where most of their days have pain and there is not that nice pain-free, um, they're not able to capture that as well. And so that pain is not just about the inflammation and the vaso occlusion, that, that traffic jam that we always think about with sickle cell. It also has to do with the nerve remodeling and central sensitization and also peripheral sensitization. And so um, things that are triggered uh, for chronic pain, um, to be worse or better does depend on your coping mechanisms, level of stress, and even whether or not you're getting enough sleep. How we think about chronic pain is quite important. And we had to borrow from the pain, uh, other pain worlds. Um, so things that have helped diseases like fibromyalgia um, or um, complex regional pain syndromes, those are some of the therapies that we now incorporate into chronic pain management and not just focusing on that acute part of the pain. Um, and so for women, one of the things that is troubling is that when they hit puberty, um, there are a subset of teenagers and um, uh, adult women that have more pain associated with their menstrual cycles. And so 40% said that, oh yeah, I have way more pain during my menstrual cycles and I actually present more to the hospital because of that, just in general for a sickle cell complication. 
So um, to wrap this part up, I just want to emphasize that the pain is real. Um, it's hard that that has to be part of this message, um, but it's, it, it's, it's important to emphasize that the pain is real. Uh, pain is hard to treat in any disorder, um, but for sickle cell, there have been several challenges related to stigma and not being believed or being seen as a pain, a, a drug seeker. And um, it's unique and complicated. It can have the acute more, uh, more uh, common presentation, but then chronic is, is there and you can have both. And that acute pain and sometimes the chronic pain can be quite excruciating. All of this relates to a person that ends up having a lot of despair, fear, and panic. The pain is a reminder that something is wrong. And um, I love this partnership between the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America and that same former bridge that I mentioned earlier. They have this campaign called sickleselldiseasebelieveit.org. And it just gives you that snapshot of a person um, struggling with their pain and why we need to uh, understand how big this issue is. So now for our part four, um, what does it look like when you're adulting with sickle cell? Well, at 29 years old, you know, Sarah, she now has this job in marketing. She's met um, someone, she's ready to plan her wedding, um, but her hip bothers her. Her left hip has had this kind of recurrent pain. And sometimes when she's trying to make it through her busy office, like from the parking lot and on, she has difficulty and the pain gets um, more uh, worse. And so what happens when we think about progressive organ damage and sickle cell disease? What are those chronic complications? We discussed the acute ones earlier. And then we will talk about mortality in this section. So here's our same mortality curve. Even though this curve, this uh, publication was published in 2010, I like the way I, I like the way it represents things. And what about now? Have things changed? Well, we don't have a true uh, curve like this one, if you will, like meaning we need more data points. But in projected models, uh, we now say that people with sickle cell disease live two decades less than the general population. And so that's a little bit better than what was captured in this 2006, um, 2010 paper but it's still a quite a stark difference, two decades less than the general population. Um, and that bodes for men and women. And so um, similar to how women live longer, the general population, um, women with sickle cell disease also tend to live longer than their male uh, counterparts. So what are these um, chronic uh, complications? And so I mentioned that sickle cell is a chronic disease with acute complications and they are, the acute complications can be unpredictable, but the chronic part is progressive. So, you know, we've talked about pain at length, but it's something that can kind of continue to build on um, itself until the, issue, the area is either completely destroyed and permanent damage, or you have recurring uh, problems. And so I, you can even count things like delayed growth as a chronic complication. Um, and, um, and, and that is a, a big issue with, with younger children. When we focus on adulthood, not just chronic pain being an issue, but avascular necrosis, um, the bone, and, and all the spectrum of bone disease and sickle cell disease, as well as having um, nephropathy and retinopathy. So these are all things that we uh, pay attention to. One of the more severe complications that is associated with mortality is pulmonary hypertension. Um, reproductive complications also start to um, uh, kind of rear their ugly heads, both for males and females. And, and this is also part of that chronic um, component of having sickle cell disease and the damage to organs that is repeated. So um, in this particular paper, when they looked at the irreversible damage, what were the things that seemed to be the biggest? Well, gallbladder disease, avascular necrosis, again, of the bone, sickle cell chronic lung disease. So all that repeated damage, acute chest and other um, issues leading to more of a chronic lung um, condition, uh, ulcers, priapism in males and strokes and retinopathy. And you notice there's not um, a clear uh, expression of what impacts women. And that's because we had lots of data gaps when, it looked, when we looked at women and also reproductive health issues. And so I really appreciate that this is now changing, starting with some advocacy from impacted individuals with sickle cell disease who worked with their, um, their uh, healthcare partners as well 
as um, you know, they went all the way to the top legislative advocacy, um, having the right meetings with the right people. This is now becoming more and more something that we're discussing. And so this recent uh, article by uh, um, Drs. Lydia Pecker and Dr. Kevin Kuo discuss the reproductive and sexual health care concerns um, from that uh, perspective of women. And so it starts even as a child, you know, when when you bring in a child to see the doctor, that paradox, I also discuss family planning with the parents. Um, and we talk about how you will often see a delay in puberty, not always, but puberty and growth, as um, as mentioned. And then we love the fact that we have therapies for sickle cell, but people do wonder about their impact on fertility. And is fertility the right word um, when you're capturing, for instance, something like hydroxyria, which is known to decrease sperm count, but decreased sperm count in of itself is not necessarily a clear, you can't just draw one line to fertility in that way. And then as you age, um, I mentioned the menstruation associated painful crises, um, and then uh, sexual health concerns, which are always things that we shy away from, but this can happen in sickle cell disease, having dyspareunia, so pain um, with sex is something that women do express. And the, the concept of nobody ever had a conversation about me about family planning. One, sometimes it's this sad view of sickle cell, well, you're not gonna have kids, but people with sickle cell disease can get pregnant and they do have children. And so we need to have these family planning conversations uh, so that they feel empowered in their decision making. And that includes genetic counseling. Even though you know your mutation for sickle cell disease, you want to discuss your partner's risk. And um, there's some nuances to um, your genetic risk that are not just boiled down to the hemoglobin S, but also some of the thalassemia components or, um, or any of your protective components as well. And then as um, one is older, um, women with sickle cell disease tend to have earlier menopause, and um, uh, usually they have they can have um, premature ovarian failure or insufficiency, and also those ongoing uh, sexual health concerns. And then, what about pregnancy? Well, um, I want to make sure. I think the time. <laughs> Let me speed up a little bit. I'll just say that with pregnancy you don't just focus on the mother, there's also fetal complications that are associated with sickle cell disease, but you do need a comprehensive care team to manage these um, conditions. It's almost like there's already the bare minimum risk factors that you have having sickle cell disease. Some of these are increased or worsened in the setting of um, pregnancy, and you're more likely to have the hypertension syndromes like preeclampsia and eclampsia. And so there's a huge team of, um, care models that is recommended, again, genetic counseling, but also just um, looking at your medications. And that might mean stopping your hydroxyria. In most cases, that's the recommendation and doing thromboprophylaxis, for instance. Opioids are used in pregnancy um, and we do discuss that potential risk. Since it's not um, high doses and you know, in the sense of somebody who has an addiction concern, it's not like we see a lot of neonatal abstinence syndrome, but it is something we want families to be aware of. All right, so the lived experience, I'm not gonna focus on this too much because we talked about it at, at length, but just know that a person is not their disease and there's so many factors that are internal to them, their social, cultural, and the healthcare that system that is supposed to care for them that impact their experience. And for sickle cell, the bedrock of this is the structural factors in our country systemic injustices, uh, institutionalized racism, and the historical framework. So just keeping that in mind. So I'll end, don't worry, I'm fast with this part. Sarah now wants to be an advocate. She just had a baby. She was reading about clinical trials. Um, she wants to learn more. And because um, I'm forgetting what time we end. So Erin, you could stop me early, but um, I over, I over I was over ambitious. So we'll talk briefly about the therapies and then a little bit about some of the um, advocacy part. But hydroxyria, 1998, well, not too many friends have joined it since then. Um, but you can see that the goal of sickle cell therapy is to target the pathophysiology. Um, and this is a quick summary slide. We won't go in detail, but L-glutamine was approved in 2017, crizolizumab in 2019, and boxellator also approved. And I put a little star because um, it was a conditional approval. And so I think you guys will have access to these slides and can look more in detail, um, but I'll move on ahead. And so what does it look like when you talk about curing sickle cell disease? 
this email came from my sister um, back in 2012. And she was like, oh, I didn't know you could cure sickle cell disease because she got this email from Be The Match um, discussing that you could be a potential cure. Um, so in the 80s, it was discovered that transplant could potentially cure sickle cell disease. And I use the word potentially curative. Um, and a lot of people have gone to the word transformative. And so um, transplant, especially when it's with a match-related donor, is quite good, especially in children. Um, things that make it difficult is that there is the limited donor pool and then the various risks associated with transplant. And so uh, the reason why adults usually do worse is because they have more organ damage and they respond worse to the interventions and have more complications. And so that's um, something to just keep in mind. Um, there are research studies looking at alternative donors such as haplotransplants and growing evidence in that area. And then of course, the current um, uh, hype and all this stuff is about gene therapies, which is a transplant. Um, and so keeping that in mind, and this slide just shows um, any product, uh, gene therapy research study that has published data. And so two of them come from the FDA approved therapies as well as other folks looking at um, um, how, to, how to fix the problem. And so it boils down to three main ways. You either add in a healthy gene, gene addition, you um, can edit the gene in various ways to stimulate the production of fetal hemoglobin. And so gene addition makes you look basically like sickle cell trait, at least in the, this approved version. And then for the fetal hemoglobin indu induction, you look like somebody with hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. Gene correction is trying to do both, take away the abnormal gene and add in a new one or um, uh, gene edit. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into detail since um, you are aware of these therapies, but these are the two that were approved. Very similar in regards to they're approved in ages 12 and up, and you have to have sickle cell and a history of vasoclusive events. And here's the information about their clinical trials. One of them does have a black box warning um, for malignancy uh, based on the trial, and also um, th this known um, risk for transfusion dependent anemia with those with two gene deletion alpha thalassemia trait. There are still some unknowns. Um, the recommendation from the FDA is to continue to follow these patients um, for 15 years, uh, but we're, and there's folks doing uh, research on these potential off risk, off target effects. How do I feel about the therapies? Um, all, all things with sickle cell, for me, it's complicated. Um, I used to always say, and still say water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. You know, we promote the therapies it's in the media, but there's a lot of um, and, um, this kind of bittersweet feeling about it. And so I'll just leave you with that, just to know that it's not, you know, there's a lot of barriers that make it difficult to be fully happy. Um, one of the barriers was this history of uh, the drama with sickle cell therapeutics. And so one of the things I tell families is just that we are better, we've learned, and we have more people at the table that represent them. Um, so let me probably stop here. This is uh, about health policy strategies. And I think the main thing to say is that solving a problem with like sickle cell is not just looking at it as a disease, but redefining the problem. And so um, that has been done by advocates, starting with those from the 60s and 70s. And here's a shout out to that with the first sickle cell act. And you can see that every time you had a sickle cell act, there was a move in this timeline. I highlighted FDA's um, efforts like the Orphan Drug Act and the approval. Okay, so I think we'll stop here. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that when you're reaching out to the community, and I know FDA has a history of doing this, that helps be part of the solution, elevating the voices that are affected, knowing that you need the lived ex experience experts there at the table with you and breaking down the complexities and making these updates accessible to them. Um, I'll skip over my state um, unless you're really interested in that. And I think this is the last slide. <laughs> so I apologize. I hope there's still time for questions. Um, but just um, to know that sickle cell is an ancient disease and there's a lot of disparity and stigma associated with it. And our outcomes that we see today are reflective of those. And so though it's wonderful that we have emerging therapies, it is a double-edged sword, but all in all, I'm, I'm still a very hopeful person and I'm glad that we have more to offer for our families today. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fashipa, for an excellent presentation. You're perfect on time. Thank you. Okay, good.
Yeah. yeah, we appreciate the amazing work that you've done on sickle cell disease, and thank you for sharing it with us today. So before we start the Q&A, uh, we'll just bring up our quick post poll. And just as a reminder, while we're doing that, this webinar recording will be posted on our OWH webpage, and we'll share the um, PDF of the slides as well. So our first poll question, if we can bring that up, please. Uh, a two-week-old newborn is in clinic for their second newborn screen test. The parents confide in the pediatrician that they are worried about test results because they have had a family history of sickle cell trait, and they know mom is a carrier because her obstetrician performed testing. Which of the following is the most accurate regarding newborn screening? I'm not sure if you're all able to see the post-poll questions. Do I need to stop sharing or? Uh, you might need to. Thank you. I don't see the questions that come. I don't either. Um, are we able to pull up the post poll questions, Corey? And while we are waiting, um, that last slide, okay, yeah, that last slide is just to show some podcasts that um, if you want to learn more about sickle cell disease, um, some of them through my lens and through others, and these are three to check out in honor of Sickle Cell Awareness Month. Terrific. Um, okay, well, we can um, we can skip the post poll and just go straight to the Q and A, just uh, to conserve time here. Um, so, our first Q and A discussion question: What are the notable differences regarding sickle cell in women versus men? So, the notable differences start with the biological differences. So. Um, Men, so first there's the similarities, which is most of the complications I mentioned happen pretty much uh, equally between uh, male and female. However, because, oh, there's there's the post poll questions. Do you wanna, oh, now I don't know where they are. <laughs> they came <laughs> um, Men, of course, um, when it comes to the reproductive health organs, uh, men experience priapism, and that can start early on um, in uh, teenage years. With women, puberty brings on the menstrual cycle, and some are fine. Some don't have an issue, um, but others, it seems to worsen their sickle cell experience. Um, they may be had what I call honeymoon sickle cell, then they start puberty and they start having some challenges. Um, and then when it does come to pregnancy and sickle cell, those are very unique experiences. Um, so which males, um, you know, don't don't have. And so there's this extra risk of mortality and and uh, morbidity associated with just the components of being biologically uh, female. And so I think I think. Um, I mentioned how you'll look at all these discussions about complications of sickle cell, and we didn't do a good job of reflecting on the reproductive components. But now more and more, when you look at the research and the reviews, it's there's emphasizing these uh, unique characteristics uh, because it does, it led to a gap. We weren't really studying it. We didn't know anything about uh, anti-mullerian hormone levels in females until more recently. We, you know, there are so many uh, things we didn't realize. Um, and so just some of that uh, data is women with sickle cell disease are more likely to have ovarian um, issues, like I said, premature ovarian insufficiency or failure. Um, they can still get pregnant, but they just have higher risk in that area. So I'll stop there, but there are differences, um, but our data sometimes has not fully captured it. Got it. Thank you. What are the biggest research gaps now in sickle cell disease? Mm -hmm. So I mentioned one of them in the area of reproductive health. Um, so whenever you have the bright, shiny toy out, so gene therapy coming out, and there's tons, there's a few more clinical trials on that, which is wonderful. And I love the fact that some of those, those research studies are not focused on developing the next gene therapy, but they're focused on understanding the potential risk factors. Um, and so NIH has funded uh, some of these uh, studies to look further. So I'm glad that that is an area 
that we are investing in. But one of the things we wanted NIH and other research funders to know is that a person with sickle cell disease, not everybody's going to get gene therapy. And definitely, even if they wanted it, they can't always get it now and today, right, based off of age and other factors. So we have to think about how do we protect those organs? Hydroxyria is not enough. It's wonderful, but it's not enough. And not everybody is able to tolerate hydroxyria, especially in adulthood. And so um, our research gaps are still in that organ damage. How do we prevent that? How do we find better ways to manage pain? Um, that's a big, um, and I don't know if you are aware of the NIH HEAL grant that is looking at that as well. And so pain is a big area, reproductive um, health and that biology and those gaps, and then also um, trying to prevent that progressive organ damage. Thank you. Um, our next question, do you use combinations of new medicines for refractory patients or serial monotherapy? Yeah, and that slide, um, I don't know if I should go back to it, but um, I, that I kind of briefly showed, it um, it shows that we are still trying to figure that out. <laughs> That's the honest answer. So I will say that right now, most people are probably in a more... Um, reaction or, uh, and I'm just going to quickly show it. So hydroxyria, since 2014 guidelines from NIH came out, we we're supposed to use it in a preventive way. You don't wait for complications to start, which used to be the old dogma. Now you're a baby, start it. So nine months and older. This is new. In the olden days, it was reactive. And depending on your type of sickle cell, we still use it in a reactive way. With the newer therapies, they need to build their evidence up, right? Like we have years of data on hydroxyria. And so right now you could consider using them in a preventive way. Um, and you can start with the age, right? They're only approved by certain ages. So boxellator is approved in four and up, L-glutamine in um, five and up, and prisoluzumab 16 and up. So if you wanted a preventive model, you can say, well, when you're four, we're going to do this. Or when you're five, we should talk about this. Um, but I've noticed in real world practice, it tends to be reactive with the newer ones. You're doing great on hydroxyria until you're not. So now let's think of one of these. Um, there are people doing great on hydroxyria that have a low hemoglobin. And so I, I've seen boxellator sometimes be a little bit more preventive, but in general, because they're new, they tend to have a reactive approach to them. Um, that is my experience. I don't know if everybody will give the same answer. Well, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, have you compared the results against other hemoglobinopathies such as G6PD deficiency and thalassemias? And it's a combination question. And how do these treatments compare among different ethnic groups who suffer from this disease? Okay, I want to make sure I capture the question properly. So, um, when we think about red blood cell disorders, there's a few different categories. One is hemoglobinopathies, and that is sickle cell disease and thalassemia only. Um, then there's enzyme um, deficiencies like G6PD and uh, pyruvate kinase. And then there's membrane uh, problems like spherocytosis. Um, I believe the person is asking about, so for instance, hydroxyria, you can use it in sickle cell disease and it's guaranteed uh, as a, it's a, a evidence-based FDA approved. Um, but you'll read literature in thalassemia, especially some of the ones that are not transfusion dependent, where hydroxyria can help them as well. Um, the data is smaller and not as far as sickle cell, um, but that is an example of when a medicine is used for two different types of hemoglobin disorders. And then the only other example I can think of is maybe the person is referencing um, drugs that target pyruvate kinase activation. Um, they are used in... Uh, pyruvate kinase deficiency, and now they're being studied in clinical trials in sickle cell disease. Um, but G6PD does not have a treatment that I'm aware of, um, except for preventive care, um, you know, uh, avoiding the triggers. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I fully captured what they were trying to express, but sometimes shared biology between red blood cell disorders do allow them to respond to medications, not, maybe not in a similar way, um, and I just want to emphasize, unlike sickle cell disease, or I should emphasize, sickle cell disease, because of that sickling, it makes it quite unique among the other ones. The other ones don't have that same um, 
chronic repeated hits. Thalassemia does have chronic disease um, component associated with it, but it looks quite different. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I hope I uh, captured uh, what they were um, what they were hoping to hear. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you again. This concludes the Q&A. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. And a big thank you to our speaker, Dr. Titi Lope Fashipa. For thank thank yeah. you. For attendees who are claiming CE, the CE claiming code is in the chat and will be emailed along with the claiming instructions to all registered participants. It'll be emailed within 24 hours. Um, the link to the webinar recording will be shared in the next couple of weeks. You can follow the FDA Office of Women's Health on social media and our YouTube channel for information and resources to help promote the health of women. So again, thank you for joining us today. This concludes our presentation. Goodbye.